hemorrhages and traumatic brain injury. And all I'm going to really do, do is go through some basic concepts. I think that you guys uh, take care of a lot of our patients that come in. Uh, you know, when we're on call, we, we admit patients, probably one or two patients to each hospital every night. Um, so it's a very prevalent part, thankfully, because of the NFL and concussion uh, awareness. It, this has made our job overall much better because it's increased the awareness of things. But what I want to sort of just do is go through some basic pathology imaging studies because I think a lot of you just want to know what does this patient have? You hear a lot of the words that we use, buzzwords, when we come and take care of patients, but really don't quite understand what's going on, if it's serious or not. So um, overall, there's about 500,000 cases of head injuries in the U.S. per year, which is quite a bit. It accounts for about 50% of all trauma fatalities per year, and about 200,000 people or more suffer from varying degrees of disability from head trauma, so whether it's severe or minor. And there's different types of head trauma. Uh, I'm going to go through each of these individually, but the first one is concussion, which I'm going to just talk briefly about, and Aaron will talk more about. Uh, diffuse axonal injury, or DAI, with petechial hemorrhages, interparenchymal hemorrhages, contusions, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages, which is one of the most common things that we see, subdural hematomas, epidural hematomas, skull fractures, and then foreign body or missile injuries. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? In the back? Okay. So the key here is talking about head, head, head imaging strategies. The real key is that imaging studies provide us a diagnosis of many of the head injuries that we see that come in through the hospital, and it acts as a roadmap for us, okay? It helps us determine the best operative approach if we need to, but the real key here is that it is no way does a scan, whether it's a head CT or an MRI scan, replace a good neurologic examination. And that's why we rely on you and us, the ER physicians, and everybody actually see the patient and examine the patient. And the key is to do serial examinations on the patient, to do follow-up examinations. Because what we want to do is to see if there's any interval changes in the patient's clinical examination, and see if there's any change in their neurological status. That's what's really key here for the patient. It doesn't matter necessarily just what the images show. What is their neurological examination? That's what we want to be treating more so than anything. My mentor always say, don't treat the pictures, treat the patient. That's the key. So just to sort of review briefly um, imaging, because I think all of you are always very interested when I come to the ICU, I always want to sort of just look at the pictures with us. This is a CT scan, okay? Very basic here. So this is um, the white stuff. In CT scans, the white stuff is typically calcified material, okay? So the bone, the skull. So the white is the skull, and the gray material is the brain tissue. The black is the spinal fluid sections, okay? So the ventricular aspects of the brain. And you see these things in here. Some glands within the brain do calcify starting from our teenage years. So the pineal gland, the choroid plexus, which sits within the ventricular system, those start to calcify. So sometimes you see this and say, oh, is that blood? It's actually not blood. It's just calcifications within the brain. So it's important to say that because we don't want to be admitting people with normal calcifications. And how does that differ from blood? So this is what a normal scan looks like. And it's always good because for us dumb neurosurgeons, we can say the left and right are always equal. So if you can't tell what's going on over here, just look to the other side and say, does that look normal or not? Because sometimes people have asymmetry inside, developmental problems, and you want to say, well, is that normal or abnormal? You always have the other side to compare it to as well. There's some types of brain herniations. They're not all the same, okay? There's about six different types of herniations here. The most common one that we're always worried about that you guys are looking for in clinical examinations is uncle herniation, and that's when the brain starts to come over the edge of the tentorium from typically an epidural subdural hematoma. This is when you start to see pupillary changes in the patient. They start to dilate their pupil. It's because a nerve goes right through here, third cranial nerve goes through there, and as that gets compressed against the brainstem, they start to dilate their pupil. As soon as we hear that somebody's dilating their pupil, that's an emergency to the OR, as you guys know. Central herniation is when you have diffuse, increased swelling within the brain. It starts to go down the frame and magnum in the central portion of the uh, um, brain skull. Singulate or sub Falsine herniation, they often call that in radiology imaging when people come in with subdural hematomas. This is not necessarily a dangerous thing, uh, but we see that oftentimes when there's unilateral brain compression across. Transcalvarial is when somebody has an open defect in the skull. These are often very serious penetrating traumas or bad head injuries where somebody's not wearing a, a helmet like a motorcycle accident and you actually start to see brain tissue coming out of the skull defects. Upward herniation is when you have a mass within the cerebellar aspect of posterior fossa. Um, I've actually never seen this, but we always describe this because the tissue actually starts to herniate up because that's the next opening. And then tonsil herniation, we see this also with cerebellar or posterior fossa lesions where the cerebellar tissue actually starts to go down the frame and magnum. So concussions uh, is Latin for concuture, I think that's how you say it. Or something. 
to shake violently or concussus, which is the act of striking together. It's the most common aspect of traumatic brain injuries that we see, and there's a lot of different definitions. And unfortunately, because of those multiple definitions, we have possibly underreporting, and the rate that we think it occurs is about six per 1,000 people, but we're not really sure. If you go out there and type in concussions, uh, you'll see that there's lots of different definitions, so we're not exactly sure uh, how many actually occur. And that's about all I'm going to talk about. I'm going to have Aaron talk more about concussions. Diffuse external injury, or DAI, as you guys may hear us talking about, is a rotational acceleration deceleration, which is a shear injury in which the brain overall mass is shifted on itself, resulting in multiple areas of destroyed axons and synapses. So it's very small micro injuries. And it occurs in the white matter tracks because the axons are long, and that's, I'll show you a picture of it next, what's occurring. And what happens is people come in and they have a very altered mental status. They're in a persistent vegetative state after a head injury. Their imaging is really unremarkable. Typically you're thinking about DAI because it's micro injury. And unfortunately it can also be uh, associated with other petechial hemorrhages. And the major cause is axonal disruption, okay? The most common places we graded between one and three. It can occur in the corpus callosum, which is a combination between, it's the, it's the part that communicates across the left and right sides of the brain. The dorsal brain stem, which occurs in more severe cases. The pons, uh, midbrain, and then at, usually at the gray-white junction. So as you start going from the outside of the brain to deeper aspects, you start getting into more serious grading, one through three. And the prognosis is variable of these patients. It's dependent upon the CT scan appearance of the patient's brain and the location of the hemorrhages. So as you get from uh, level one to level three, the severity of the injury increases, and typically the degree of loss of consciousness increases too. And this is what it looks like. This is an axon. And as you have that rotational acceleration, deceleration, literally what you're doing is you're having these axons spinning amongst themselves, causing an injury. It twists, tears, and the axon dies. Okay, microscopic injury. This is to be separated somewhat than petechial hemorrhages, although they look very similar. These are high density lesions that you see on CT scans of the brain. And they're significantly smaller than what people will typically define as interparenchymal hemorrhages. Okay, so these are all really key that these are all sort of on a spectrum. Okay, so we're starting from the smallest spectrum, which was the axonal injury, to then petechial hemorrhages, which are almost little small dots. I'll show you a CT scan of what that looks like and then interparenchymal hemorrhage, which is are typically larger. And they can grow in size and convalesce and cause more edema and swelling, and they are typically associated with DAI. And this is what it looks like. So this is what I showed you a brain CT scan here. And what you'll see is these small little white lesions within the brain tissue. Kind of hard to pick up, but you can see them very microscopic. This is choroid plexus, again, maybe some blood in the ventricles. But the other difference here, again, is you don't see the nice gyri and sulci. Usually the brain looks um, like it's got sort of that spaghetti pattern, and the brain looks full here. Okay, you can't see the pattern probably from swelling. So you know this patient's had pretty severe injury, okay, especially when you see the DAI and particular hemorrhages with that. This patient's probably not going to do very well. Interparenchymal hemorrhage, so sort of stepping up to the next degree of injury. It's a high density area, so high density is usually calcifications or blood that are anatomically consistent with dissection of the brain tissue. And what's happening is there's an expanding clot within the brain tissue that's causing this. <clears throat> and with these, unfortunately, they also develop a lot of the DMAR swelling around the lesions. I always make the analogy that the brain is very similar to somebody's arm. If you pump somebody's arm or any other organ injury, they get swelling. Well, the brain reacts in exactly the same way. You get an injury with blood, you'll get focal swelling. Okay, so the problem is this also causes more mass effect within the brain. And unfortunately, you get significant mass effect if you have a lot of brain injury. And this is what it looks like here. Brain is the gray material. Here is a large interparenchymal hemorrhage, which is hyperdense blood. And what you're seeing here is the brain is starting to shift over. So we talk about the normal gyrine sulci pattern here of the brain, this is what it should look like. You can't see it as well over here. Again, signs that there's swelling and edema. And not only that, but there's midline shift of the brain that's starting to shift over. Okay, so several clues to be picked up from this. And the dark part around this is the edema. So blood is bright, fluid is dark. That's why you see the spinal fluid is black. So the blood causes the edema. So this is swelling the brain tissue around it. <coughs> 
excuse me, contusions we see a lot of, a lot of high, uh, high speed impact injuries, typically high dense areas within the brain on the head CT, which have less mass effect than the size, okay? And I'll show you what that looks like. And these unfortunately also can grow and convalesce and cause also some significant edema. These are typically on the surface of the brain, okay? The difference here between the interparenchymal is this is deep, okay? Usually this is a hemorrhage from somebody with, it could even be from a hypertensive hemorrhage or a blood vessel bursts. So the location is deep, okay? Typically when you're talking about contusions, these are on the surface of the brain, okay? And the reason is what you're having is obviously the jelly bowl effect of the brain within the rigid confines of the skull. And what happens is the brain goes forward, comes back, so you get the jiggling, and the injury occurs on the surface of the skull. The skull is not smooth inside, okay? There's lots of different things within the skull to keep the brain sort of in place. There's tentoriums and different aspects of the dura which help to sort of localize different hemispheres. And unfortunately, as you're uh, moving the brain around, the brain is hitting those edges, and there's lots of sharp edges along the skull base as well. So a lot of contusions that we've seen, you guys have seen this, two people that come in, bike accidents, falls, and things like that. These are contusions, and usually they're in those areas where the brain has hit the edges of the, of the uh, skull tissue itself. So these are the differences. The contusions are on the outside. And they've actually classified the locations in terms of the more commonly seen places for a contusion to occur versus less common. The red is more common, so the skull base, very rough edges, versus the convexity, this is more smooth on the top, and the skull base is here again, and the cerebellum back here. So very common to see frontal and temp temporal, temporal injuries okay, with these patients. And on the edges, less commonly along the edges of like the superficial aspect above the top and the cerebellum. So typically, we see very characteristic patterns. And oftentimes, you can actually see uh, the injury pattern that people had, how they hit their head. When we talk about coup and contra coup injuries, the coup is the side that they hit, the contra coup being where the brain, the brain sort of came back and hit the other side. So if you go back and look at this picture, this is probably the coup injury where they hit their head forward and came back and sort of had the contra coup on the other side of the back. Less impressive, but still present. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you guys sometimes see this in our notes, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is bleeding into the subarachnoid space. So remember, the brain tissue itself has a lining outside of it, the arachnoid. The arachnoid is just like arachna, arachnoid for spider. It's a very thin layer, it's clear. And it actually lines the brain tissue itself. There's the pia and arachnoid, okay? Those line the brain tissue itself, and then there's the dura. So this is bleeding within that sort of clear, it looks like cellophane almost, okay? And these are high density areas on the CT scan, and they surround the gyri and sulci, okay? So it almost highlights the brain. It's kind of neat. They can be very small and diffuse. This is probably one of the most common things that we see when we have to admit patients because they fall, they get a small tra traumatic subarachnoid, uh, and usually they go home the next day. Pretty minimal most of the time, but it's the most common subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because subarachnoid is also associated with aneurysm ruptures. It's a very different beast, okay? Aneurysm ruptures, which I'll show you the difference in the pictures. Aneurysms are the blood vessels deep within the brain that develop a little very outpouching and rupture, okay? High mortality, high morbidity. You guys have seen our patients with aneurysms that have ruptured. Very different than traumatic subarachnoids, okay? And this is what a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is a very dramatic subarachnoid hemorrhage here. As you can see, it's sort of highlighting the gyri and sulci. I think it's kind of neat. This is very severe. This is the most common thing that we end up admitting in the hospital. These are little aspects of traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Very small. Pretty minimal, doesn't require much. These are little veins that rupture on the brain tissue, and the patients can usually go home the next day. Now contrast that with a ruptured aneurysm. Okay, we talked about this is like the basal artery and an aneurysm that ruptures deep within the brain. Okay, traumatic subarachnoid is on the surface. This is deep within the brain. Okay, when a patient comes in and they say, oh, the patient fell and they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, this is not probably from a fall. Okay, then we got to start thinking, we need to get an angiogram on this patient. And sometimes you guys see us ordering an angiogram. You're like, why are you getting an angiogram on a patient? Well, you never know what caused the fall. I just had a patient I admitted two nights ago who had a seizure and fell. And he came in with subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we actually know the patient. He had diffuse blood 
within here and on the surface of his brain. How do we know he didn't have an aneurysm rupture and then he fell? Okay, so it's important. I've seen patients uh, in my training, they went home, they had a car accident, they sent the patient home after a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The patient went home and died, and what they found out later was they had ruptured an aneurysm. That's why they crashed the car. Okay, and if you don't treat these, they have a very high mortality. So that's why we sort of have a very high threshold, or very low threshold, to order angiograms quickly to make sure, because you want to really rule out the things that's going to kill a patient quickly and not be wrong with that kind of diagnosis. But that's the difference, okay? Deep subarachnoid versus traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. So cortical on the surface versus deep. Intraventricular hemorrhages, um, we see it quite often in patients. It's about a third of the patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries. It typically requires a very hard um, sort of force to the brain. So it's not a trivial injury uh, that occurs in intraventricular hemorrhage. It has to be extensive brain damage typically. And when people come in with intraventricular hemorrhage, it's rarely good. Now, the, the one caveat to all this is when patients come in with Coumadin and Platics and they fall, I guess it's much easier to have intraventricular hemorrhage. But when you're talking about a young, healthy patient, ordinarily, intraventricular hemorrhage is typically a bad sign. And this is what we see. So remember, the ventricles, where the subarachnoid, <coughs> sorry, where the ventricular system is and the CSF inside the brain, you get blood there. So this is coating the ventricular system. These are hard things to treat. Sometimes we put a ventriculostomy catheter, but guess what happens? They end up clotting off. So in my training, I remember having to get up every hour, you're there on call, you have to flush these ventriculostomy catheters. So these are very hard to maintain because the blood just comes into the catheter and clots it. So uh, when you see this, these typically don't have a very good outcome. Some of the treatments for this are to go in with a scope and try to wash that up. But could you imagine going in and trying to wash out all of the blood within the ventricles? Very challenging, very difficult. But when you see that, it doesn't typically portray a good uh, outcome in the patient. Subdural hematomas, um, subdurals versus epidurals. Now, subdural hematomas are outside of the brain tissue. So remember, the brain has the PR arachnoid and then the dura. So subdural is just like you think. It's underneath the dura. So not in the brain tissue, but within the layer of the dura to the arachnoid. Okay? We talked about the subarachnoid hemorrhages, which was the next layer outside the brain. This is the next layer out, which is within the subdural space. So subduras are, sub, are extra axial, which means it's outside the brain tissue, not within the brain itself, in the subdural space. They have a very characteristic appearance. They're concave, and they can cross suture lines, okay? It does not usually cross the midline, because remember, there's a false in the middle, and so the blood will typically stop at that layer. And this is to be differentiated from an epidural, which I'll show you the difference in. So, Subdurals typically look like a half covering of the entire hemisphere. Okay? These are caused by bridging veins that have torn, so they're not high pressure, they're low pressure veins that sit in there and just tear. They can come uh, from trauma, or if you tear the brain tissue itself, if it ruptures, the veins that are sitting in the overlying brain tissue can also rupture. And they don't require much to occur. Especially in the elderly, we see this a ton. People that fall on Coumadin, they come in with the small subdurals. And what we see is a lot of people that come in with chronic subdurals, okay? Chronic subdurals, you see us at video. They have these huge subdural hematomas, but it happened, it's been happening over weeks to months. And I'm going to show you the difference between an acute and a chronic. So again, what does the patient look like? That's what's going to dictate the treatment of the patient. Um, <clears throat> it's only 2% of head traumas, but 30% of severe head traumas. So there's sort of three types. There's acute, subacute, and chronic. And I'm just going to go through the three differences. Acute is just like you can imagine, dark purple, fresh blood, okay? It's gelatinous collections of acute clotted blood. And oftentimes, acute subdurals, if they get large enough, are the ones that require an acute craniotomy. You know, we get that phone call, and somebody comes in with an acute subdural hematoma from a trauma bay, typically you're heading to the OR, okay? They're bright on CT scan, which I'll show you, and their, their overall prognosis is worse than an epidural because the injury required to cause a subdural is much higher than an epidural. Okay, again, the degree of blood that you see in types of blood patterns can often tell you what kind of mechanism the patient has under you know, the injury that they've suffered. When you see somebody with an acute subdural, you better get them to the, to the OR immediately. And this is what it looks like. Okay, This is the brain tissue, this is what the subdural looks like. So we talked about covering a good portion of the brain tissue itself, bright, high, uh, acute blood. Okay. And what you look at sometimes is if you measure the thickness of the blood here, it doesn't correspond with the thickness of brain uh, shift. 
And what that's telling you is there's a lot of edema and brain issue, uh, injury going on here. Okay? If you have a half a centimeter of blood here, why would you have a centimeter of shift? Well, you better believe that patient's got a, a lot of traumatic brain injury going on. Okay? And that's why this, this is bad. I mean, you, you, what you do is you measure the midline here, the faults. You can see parts of the faults here. The brain is shifting over. This should be over here. Okay? Remember, symmetry. You can't even see the ventricle over here anymore. It's squashed. So this patient to the OR now, okay, that's that stat call for the patient. That's to be differentiated from a subacute subdural hematoma. These are typically a couple days to a couple weeks old. They're isodense, so what happens is as blood starts to break down and reabsorb, it goes from being bright to dark. Okay, remember, it liquefies, just like spinal fluid. So it starts to become isodense, which is mean the same color as brain tissue. So it's going from bright to the same color as brain tissue. And it's liquefied and solidified, yeah, solidified clot in there. And sometimes we have to do a small craniotomy to take that out. You can't do a small craniotomy to take out a big clot. You do the big opening. You see people, we leave the bone flap actually off on these patients. The reason is because they're going to have rebound brain intracranial hypertension. That's going to want to come out. And we want this brain to come out this way, not across. So we do large flaps for these to evacuate the clots. As these things start to liquefy, we can start to do smaller and smaller treatments. So chronic subdurals are the ones that we see in these elderly people that come into the hospital. And we kind of park them for a couple days or on two minutes. And we say, oh yeah, we'll do them in a couple days. People are like, why? Do they have a subdural hematoma. Well, these are typically much older. And when you actually ask the patient, oh yeah, they fell, they hit their head on the car door, they stood up in the bathroom, they hit their head on a cabinet, it's not much trauma, but they're anticoagulated. And as their brains shrink down, the bridging veins are sort of suspended across the brain to the skull, a little cut, a little tear, that little vein just kind of oozes slowly and they're uncumulated. So it causes sort of this very slow oozing in the brain and sort of this slow decline, that's what brings them in. And oftentimes what happens is they develop an inflammatory membrane because the, the body's very good at trying to treat itself. So it's trying to fix the problem so it starts to develop a membrane around these blood clots. And oftentimes as this starts to liquefy, it looks like motor oil. So some of you have seen these in the OR, it's black fluid. Right? We, we, we open up the dura and this black fluid comes, looking, comes squirting out, it looks like motor oil. And oftentimes we can do a burr hole or a very small opening because it, it liquefies and comes out very easily. So this is the difference between what I showed you before, an acute versus a chronic. So now notice the color of the blood here. It's dark. That's been there for a long time. But look at the degree of brain shift, OK? Remember I showed you the trauma? That patient's going to the OR now. This one, this patient's walking around with a little bit of a headache, confusion, and they've got a centimeter midline shift, OK? Much different. The brain's very good at adapting its slow injuries. And this is always an interesting pattern. What happens is the patient's laying down in the CT scanner, right? So gravity, the heavier heme from the blood products, float back. So it's kind of get this graded coloration as the blood products lay back. It's not, they call it acute blood, which it is, but it's not really, it's still not the same concept as what I showed you with the acute subdural. Okay? So when you see these people coming with this dark, always think to yourself, older, liquefied, not a big deal, as much. Now that's to be contrasted with epidural hematoma. So these are typically biconvex extraaxial. So remember the dura, subdural. Now we're again moving out to the next level. Epidural between the dura and the brain and uh, in the skull. Okay, the dura is the next lining to the skull. So epidural on top of the dura. Still not within the brain tissue itself. And what happens is it dissects between the table of the skull and the dura. It's actually got enough force that it's dissecting the dura. Sometimes you've seen us in the OR trying to dissect the dura with pen fields and, and instruments. Well, imagine the brain and the blood force that it requires to actually pull that dura off. So what happens is these are often associated with skull fractures. They don't cross suture lines because the suture lines are where the dura is typically stuck. Okay? So when you start to get a hematoma, it will typically pull away to the point that it gets to a suture line. And so <clears throat> it's typically a high density mass on CT scan. And it can be isodense when people come in with hyper, hyper acute blood. But most often think bright blood, bright on CT scan. 1% uh, of head traumas, we don't see these very often. Okay? We see it in the temporal parietal area. The reason is that there is the artery that runs on the outside of okay? the brain here. Very thin bone. As you guys know, it's very thin right here on your temples. And what happens is it's an arterial bleeder, arterial high pressure, contrasted with the subdural, which is low pressure. Okay? 
So the mechanism to tear these is not that high. 10 to 27 percent of epidural hematoma patients have loss of consciousness. They have a classic lucid interval and neurologic collapse. So the classic baseball to the head, no problem. What happens? A couple minutes later, they fall flat and they're dead. You guys have heard that story. It's always in the news. They were fine and they fall over dead. That's the classic lucid interval. Okay? They do it. The artery ruptures. They're looking great. Next thing you know, whoosh, they're dead. So that's the difference with the epidurals. That's why we probably don't see a ton of these in the ER. Okay? Because most people just don't even survive it by the time it's recognized. 50% develop contralateral hemiparesis. That's from brain compression. And the blown pupil immediately. Okay? Surgical management, symptom changes, so mental status changes, again, treat the patient. Any type of uh, affected limb movement, so weakness in one side of the body. <coughs> in an epidural that's greater than one centimeter in its thickest portion. Because remember, epidurals will bleed fast. So you can't sit around and say, I'll get a scan in four hours. Four hours, better believe that patient's likely going to be toast. Significant changes on serial CT scans with worsening function. I, I don't ever really watch these on, on patients. Uh, the prognosis overall is better if there's a lucid interval than if they were actually comatose initially. Okay, Because if a patient comes in comatose, it's probably pretty late for them to have a good meaningful recovery. They come in and you get, we had a guy who actually crumped in the CT scanner. Okay, He came in, he was doing fine, crumped in the CT scanner, and got in the OR within 15, 20 minutes. I mean, that's a, the best prognosis for the patient. You know, what happens in the hospital. And this is what it looks like. So very different than a subdural. Remember, the subdural is kind of, we call it like a, a this is a lens shape. Okay, Epidurals are lens shaped. The other ones are sort of like this half moon shape. Okay? So what's happening is the blood is splitting the dura. The dura is kind of like being pushed out. Okay? And this is the middle meningeal artery that sits right here that ruptures. These are classic. The problem is this is low down in the brain. The brain stem is right here. So we're not talking about a, a hemorrhage that's up on the upper convexity where you can have shift of the brain up top. This is low down by the temple. As this thing moves across, the brain stem is right there. Okay? So temporal compression, blown pupil. That's an OR right away. Depressed skull fractures, we don't take care of a lot of these. We see them, uh, but typically a fracture of the skull where the inner and outer tables have been fractured through and through and do not align. So we see a lot of non-displaced skull fractures. People get admitted with non-displaced skull fractures, not anything for us to do for those typically. But we worry about depressed skull fractures. Typically they don't require surgery. The reason they would require surgery is if the patient develops symptoms. Okay, again, treat the patient, not the picture. What you'll see is clear lucencies through the skull base, or this, sorry, so the skull or the skull base, the cranial vault. Sometimes they're hard to difficult to uh, identify. We don't often see these necessarily because of the planes of the CT scan. And there's oftentimes the sinuses that can be filled with fluid. Okay, so if you fracture through the skull and there's usually sinuses that have air in it, well, if you fracture through some of the CSF, more fluid can fill it. So we see fluid filled sinuses, or if they leak CSF through their nose, if you guys have some sinus in our patients. They develop pneumocephalus because the air starts to get sucked into the head. Battle skull fractures are bad. Okay? Oftentimes we see CSF orderrhea, so people have rhinorrhea through the nose, through the ear. Okay? CSF leaks through the ear. You guys have seen our patients with those. Blood behind the ear. A battle sign, which I'll show you a picture of, which is the uh, uh, blood clot behind the ear, okay? the subcutaneous tissues. That's called a battle sign. Or periorbally. The raccoon signs, those are skull fractures because blood is leaking out into the subcutaneous tissues. They can have cranial nerve palsy, so if these injuries are through the skull base with the cranial nerves, which are very delicate hair-like structures, enough force to injure the skull base. Typically, you can injure the, the, the nerves also. Um, this use of meningitis, the ENT guys will oftentimes put on kind of antibiotics. We don't always do that. That's controversial in the literature. Uh, this is what the skull base fractures oftentimes look like. Raccoon's eyes, okay, you guys have seen our patients with these oftentimes at a battle sign. You've got to kind of look for it, but what happens is because the patient's laying back, the blood pools behind the ears. Okay, so you get that subcutaneous hematoma. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it looks just like that, but there's a, a dark spot right there. And this is what a severe case of a depressed skull fracture would look like. In kids, we call them ping pong fractures, okay, ping pong ball, push a ping pong ball, you get the same kind of appearance, and usually you can pop those right back out. This would probably be treated because the patient probably has weakness on one side of the body or they can cause seizures, so that's the indication to treat it. Oftentimes, people want to get it treated because it's cosmetic, right? Nobody wants to walk around with what we call the punch bowl appearance. Nobody wants to have that <laughs> defect. I'm sorry, it's what we call it. It is what it is. 
Um, so it's cosmetic for a lot of people, right? Frontal injury, they get a little dimple there, they want us to fix that. Foreign body missile injuries, we don't get a ton of that in this area. This is not the uh, knife and gun club that we have around here. It's typically a bone debris form uh, body material that goes through or within the brain tissue. Um, it's important for us as neurosurgeons to assess where the entry and exit sites are because you can sort of make an assessment as to what type of brain injury they have. And that will also be important for us trying to get the hemorrhage under control. Oftentimes we give broad spectrum antibiotics because you can imagine it's dirty, whether it's a bullet or if you see, you know, kids can shoot bow and arrows through each other, stuff like that. It's kind of crazy stuff that you see. Uh, so we oftentimes will put them on antibiotics because they can develop an abscess around that uh, injury. Uh, gunshot wounds are rare. I've seen a couple here in town. Um, they're their own classification. It's a special category of injury. Um, it's the majority of penetrating head injury that we see. Gunshots just because of the degree of um, uh, force that we have behind bullets. 35% uh, of deaths from brain injury in patients under the age of 45. So you're typically young people. And very lethal. Okay, this is a really important statistic. Two thirds of patients die at the scene. 90% of the patients die later. So I've only seen one patient in 14 years that's actually survived a gunshot wound or that. Okay, it's pretty much a lethal injury through and through. Patients come in, they say, oh, they're awake or they're moving and stuff like that. True, unlikely they're going to survive them. You know, the whole thing with Gabby Giffords, very rare that that occurs, you know. But this is this is the problem. This is a through and through injury. This is this is injured critical structures. Okay, you can say, oh yeah, this brain tissue looks good, this brain tissue looks good. The problem here is is the E equals MC squared, thanks to Albert Einstein. It's the force of the missile that goes through there, okay? Although this is the trajectory of injury, we talk about the shock wave injury to the brain up and down. Okay, it injures the frontal tissues, the back, and the brain stem typically, and that's the end of it. We don't take these to the OR. Patients say, take the OR, pop the flaps off. No, there's nothing to do. This patient will not survive. And this is a true case that occurred in Australia, I think, two years ago. Uh, they found the patient. Uh, so I'm just going to go through real quick uh, brain injury management, since I think that's kind of an important uh, thing for you all. This is sort of just a real thing. And this is a whole lecture topic in and of itself. But intracranial pressures, ICPs, uh, which is what we're always concerned about, the overall pressure within the skull for patients. It's the pressure within the cranial vault for the patient. It varies with activity, but normal ICPs is typically 0 to 10. All of us here probably have a resting ICP of about 0 to 10. It fluctuates between that as we cough, sneeze, valsalva, things like that. Our pressures go up and down. You've seen our patients with monitors in their head. A normal resting patient will have normal variations in their pressures. If it's elevated over 20, which is typically our rule of thumb, at rest is considered a concern. And there's lots of things that can elevate our ICPs. And elevated ICPs start to adversely affect the brain tissue. Okay, that's the problem. That's why we want to treat it. And it's very important. This is the mineral Kelly doctor. This is what neurosurgeons live on. Okay? You have just a couple things within the cranial vault. Okay, it's a sealed system. You have venous blood, arterial blood, brain, and spinal fluid. That's all that lives within there. Okay? As you develop a mass effect, a hematoma, a tumor, it starts to displace one of these things. Okay? And there's so much you can displace. A little bit of CSF can fall out, a little bit of venous volume, until it reaches a critical mass. Okay? So the brain can compensate for some time. Once it gets to a critical mass, you start to affect the brain tissue itself. So that's why we put in vitreous velocity catheters. We're draining CSF. So let's at least eliminate one of these. That makes sense? So that gives us a room for the brain swelling itself. Because we don't want the brain tissue itself to be injured. So when we get people with uncontrolled ICPs, we're talking surgical decompression or mannitol. That helps decrease brain volume by essentially dehydrating the brain. Or we're taking them to surgery for a decompressive craniotomy. So this is the brain tissue here. We're opening the dura. The brain is starting to swell out. Okay. So that's the very basic sort of um, principle that we live by to treat these patients with um, brain injuries. So just one real quick conclusion slide. The traumatic brain injury patient has significant management issues beyond those of the typical trauma patient. Um, Aaron's going to talk about the post-hospital and intra-hospital management of some of these patients. The key to being successful in treating traumatic brain injuries: is understanding the diagnosis, medical management of head trauma, recognizing changes early. Okay, treat the patient. That's why we'd love for you guys to call us. Okay, never hesitate to call us. Pupils changing, weakness one side, alter mental status, call us. Okay, time is critical. There's no single therapy or guideline that's appropriate for all these patients because um, they don't occur in a vacuum, right? You've got to take the patient's overall situation. That's what I was trying to show you. There's different types of head injuries. What is the mechanism of injury? What do they look like? How old are they? What are the um, 
what kind of blood thinners are they on, things like that. So it's really important to sort of put all of these considerations um, together overall. So that's sort of all I have. Uh, Josh Meadows is one of the guys that trained with back in Wisconsin and uh, 